choir come up, please. Everyone help us sing today.
forward to uh, to all that we uh, do today. We just want to make a few announcements this morning, remind you about a few things. If you're a part of our joy group, that's our just over youth group, uh, we're going to have an activity on March the 12th uh, going to Cracker Barrel. So if you're a part of our joy group, uh, we want to encourage you to come out uh, for that. If you've never participated in the past, uh, but you fit that group, <laughs> Uh, you can come with us, and uh, we want everyone who's a, uh, to come and be a part of that, and that'll be a lot of fun, so please come. I make plans for that on March the 12th. That's a Tuesday. We'll leave here at 8.30 in the morning and go and have uh, a good day. Also, I want to remind you that beginning next week will be our annual Bible conference with Dr. Myron Geiler, and he'll be here uh, Sunday through Friday. And uh, again, we just look forward to that. We hope you'll make plans to be here every night at that meeting if you can. And uh, Dr. Geiler will preach for us. We'll have good uh, music each night. And then on Friday, the Marietta Bible College Choir will be here to sing for us. And uh, they'll uh, have a, a good uh, music program for us. It'll be a blessing. We'll be able to hear a message through those songs, and we look forward to that as well. We like to, when, our, when the choir comes, uh, to provide a meal for them as they'll travel uh, here from Marietta. And then we like to provide a dinner for them before the service on that evening. And we're going to pass around a sign-up sheet in just a moment if you'd like to help by... Uh, providing some of those items for us uh, for that meal. That would be a great blessing, and we'll uh, use uh, to have a meal for them on that, uh, on that evening. And also, if you'd like to help on that day by helping us prepare the food and have things ready uh, for them when they come, that would also be a great blessing as well. Uh, and so we just want to encourage you to do that. And uh, so we'll send that around in just a moment, and you can uh, sign up for those things. But this time, we'll ask our men to come. We'll take up Ty's offering and faith promise this evening. Excuse me, this morning. Amen. Well, let's pray. Amen. 
Amen. Well, before our pastor comes, Brother Ken is going to ha come have a special for us. You come right ahead. Amen. I'm ready. Thank you. Words cannot describe its beauty as upon the stream it grows. Matchless in its glory, the tender little rose. When its petals are broken, its greatest beauty it shows. Far more sweeter than the fragrance of the broken rose, the most beautiful rose was broken one day, nailed to a tree on a hill far away, forsaken by his of heaven's rose continually dwells the most beautiful rose was broken one day nailed to a tree on a hill far away forsaken by his
thank you, Ken. Appreciate the good song today, and it's so good to see you today. Appreciate folks being here on last uh, Sunday in the month of February. Uh, we gather in next uh, Sunday, Lord willing. It'll be uh, the month of March, and uh, be right on into uh, our Bible conference. I'm excited about next Sunday night. That'll begin our Bible conference, and uh, we'll have Dr. Goddard with us in through Friday, and so I hope you'll be praying for him. Can't encourage you enough. If you read the, the letter in the bulletin, we're just encouraging every family, everybody to be here as faithfully as you can throughout that week. And uh, you might may mean we have to just work around a few things and uh, this and that, uh, but it'll be worth it uh, to put our life and sound under the influence of God's Word, to sit under the ministry of one of, I believe, the greatest living preachers uh, in the world today. Not great because he's anything other than a servant of the Lord, but a great Bible preacher. And so you're going to want to hear him. And then on Friday, we'll have the choir here, and they always get excited about this meeting. This is their first spring meeting uh, travel trip that they go on. So they're always excited about this. They've got their new program in place and all their new songs and everything they're going to do, they kind of come and do it here first. And so it's always exciting for them. They love to come and be here. And uh, it's just great to see them fill up the choir. And many of them come now and like to play in the orchestra and be involved in that as well. So it'll be a fun night, and uh, we need some folks who can help Friday afternoon to get the meal ready. And uh, that list that went through, uh, that list has kind of been developed and tweaked here and there over the years we've had experience with the choir. Uh, most of them are from foreign countries. Uh, their appetites and things are different than ours. The things we would normally think maybe would be great, they don't necessarily like them as well as we do. They'll eat it, but they'll be out of kindness because they've been instructed that's the right thing to do. And, uh, but they wouldn't enjoy it maybe as some other things, so we've tried to just put together things we've learned that they really like, and that's what's on that menu. And so just uh, sign up and help us out with it, and uh, we look forward to it. It's always a fun day, and the choir comes in and enjoys it and appreciates it and does such a good job. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Pray about that meeting. Invite people to come. Do your best to get the word out about it and have people here. And most importantly, be here yourself. I hope you'll pray today for uh, Brother Don Hera. He went back to the hospital this weekend. And uh, we want to just be in prayer for him. Uh, he's had a challenging time the last few years and uh, in and out of the hospital and nursing homes and rehab centers then challenging for his family as well. And we just want you to pray for him and remember him in a word of prayer. And I don't often say anything about college students. We have several that are in colleges, uh, South Carolina, West Virginia, Tennessee. We've got college students all uh, over uh, Massachusetts and all over the place. And I don't say a lot about them. But uh, I hope you'll pray for Amber. And this is Amber's first year down at Crown Bible College in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, Amber's been uh, excited for the opportunity to go and been doing a good job there. Uh, truly an opportunity that will be a life-changing thing for her. And uh, we want you to pray for her, uh, pray for her family and her, you know, the situation and circumstances are unique to Amber. We want to pray for her. But uh, she is in a situation where financially it's just really challenging for her. And uh, she's trying to finish out this year. She wants to be able to get this year in and finish it. But she's really, really needing prayer and even help, if anybody could, with her finances. And uh, so uh, if, you, if you have any questions about that or you would be interested in knowing a little bit more about that situation and might feel led the Lord to help, if you'd let me know or my wife know, we'd be glad to share that with you. There are some people already who volunteered without even being prompted uh, to give a little extra to help her. And we just kind of set that aside and uh, we're going to just let folks pray about that. But if it's something that you might be interested in and you'd like to let us know that or have any questions about it, uh, it's something that we need to do kind of quickly here. She has some deadlines coming up on some bills. And uh, so just let us know and be praying about it most of all. And uh, this year's been a great year for her uh, personally. And so we hope that you'll pray about that. And uh, if there's anything that you could do or any questions you might have about that, just let us know. But we are thankful for all of our students. And uh, they're, uh, they're working hard. And uh, this uh, year will soon be in here. So that'll be a blessing, won't it? 
and uh, get some time off and, and uh, get, uh, get your breath before you have to get back into it. But, uh, we're thankful for all of our students. And we've got several high school graduates this year. And uh, so we're going to have a lot more that are going to be graduating and heading out into schools and different things. So uh, it's a good, exciting thing. I hope you'll take your Bibles with me this morning and open them to Genesis chapter 1, first book in the Bible, the first chapter. I just want to read you the first verse. <clears throat> and more than anything, I just want to take you back here to this verse of Scripture. And if there's a, if there's a great truth that you might take away from the lesson or the message this morning, it would simply be this, is that as God's people, everything in our life must begin with the Lord. This is where it must begin. It must begin with God. And sometimes we can get so busy in life, I think we forget about how we've got to be grounded in this truth. And when we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1, here we have this verse of scripture that says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you'll see that word beginning, it's right next to God. And that's the way it needs to be in our life. This is where everything must begin in our life. It must begin with God. And I just want to remind you of that today as we look into the Word of God. Let's pray together and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue. Father, we are thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for the grace that you've shown us, your love and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for every one who's been able to attend the services today. We pray for many others, Lord, who are sick and under the weather and not feeling well and not able to get out and be here with us today. We just pray for them. You'd restore back their health and strength and that, God, the very first thing they'd want to do would be to join together with other of believers in the house of God. We just pray, Father, that, Lord, you'd protect these people and strengthen us, Lord, and keep us free and healthy and, Lord, uh, safe from any type of uh, illnesses so that we can live for you and serve you. And, Lord, we just pray today that you'll bless our Bible club with all those children and may your word just be the incorruptible seed that will be planted in their hearts and lives and bring forth the fruit of salvation. Uh, Lord, we pray today that, God, you'll Bless and work and minister now in this uh, service. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege we've had to join together to hear your word. And well, we just ask God that we will just give you the worship and praise you desire by having an open and obedient heart, attentive, Lord, to you and your word. Well, we need the Holy Spirit today to work in our hearts and lives to take these truths and supernaturally, uh, Lord, make them real to us. Lord, we pray that we'll be uh, obedient children. And God, we're just asking today that you would bless and work in our hearts and lives and help remind us, Lord, of where it all must begin for us in every aspect of our lives. Pray if somebody's come to church today, but they've never come to Christ as they sit in their seat this morning, they could not say, Pastor, I know I'm saved and this is why I believe I'm going to be in heaven someday. Lord, if that's true of anyone here today, I pray today would be the day, <clears throat> Lord, when they realize that, God, they need you as their personal Savior from their own sin debt that separates them from God. And Lord, we pray today they'll be saved. So we just commit it all to you and we'll thank you for what you're going to accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We look at this verse. This is one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And we know that the Bible is God's revelation of, uh, of Himself to fallen and sinful man. That's what God's Word is. Over 66 books, He reveals Himself to be the uh, God that has sent the Savior. And that men need the Savior God has sent. And it all begins for us, at least here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. But we understand that this is not where it all begins with God. We know that the Bible teaches us God had no beginning. God did not begin here, but God's revelation of Himself begins here. Well, the first word that you find here for God, this word that you find in verse 1, is the word Elohim. And it appears 2,500 times in the Bible. It's one of the most common ways in which God chooses to reveal Himself to man. Do you know that every name of God in the Bible has a meaning? And every time God chose to use it, He chose to use it in a specific way. Not by accident, not by 
just happenstance, but it's a continual progression of God's revelation of Himself unto men. And He reveals Himself through His names. This is the name Elohim. It's an unusual word. If we classified it, we would say that it's this. It's a uniplural noun. And that doesn't sound right even to begin with because uni or uni usually designates one and plural designates more than one. But this is a one word that designates more than one. And that's the way God chooses to begin to reveal himself unto us. And that though he is one God, he's three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And yet though they're three, they're one. And that's how he chooses here to begin this revelation, it's a, it's, a, it's a compilation of two words. The word El in the Hebrew language means strength. And the uh, latter part of the word Elohim is from the word Allah, meaning to swear or to bind oneself with an oath. And so God says, I am the strong and faithful one. And though that way then God begins to help us to understand who He is. From the very beginning then we see that there's a real God. And this God has come into the world and is acting in this world to redeem and rescue the souls and the lives of sinful men. God the Father is the one that loved the world and gave His only begotten Son. And God the Son came and lived that perfect and sinless life and offered up His perfect soul as an acceptable sacrifice on our behalf unto God. And God accepted that sacrifice. And now God the Spirit is alive and working in this world, convicting men of their sin, convicting them of God's righteousness and our lack of righteousness, convincing and convicting men of judgment to come and of the judgment we are already under, that we're already condemned without Christ as lost sinners. And God is revealing Himself here as this God in Genesis 1.1. When a man is saved, we know that that God comes into his, man, into his life. He comes in to live in his heart. And God desires from that moment forward to continue to work through our lives and accomplish the work of God in this world, reaching souls and the lives of more men. And God is doing that work in the world. And you know, one of the things that I've realized that that, uh, that is important for all of us to realize is that God will get His work done with or without us. God will get His work done with or without you. But the thing that we ought to realize is that I know for me, I don't want it to be that way. I don't want it to be without me. I want to be involved. I want, I want to be used. I want God to keep me usable. And in this world, I want to make a difference that will matter a million years from now. And that's what God wants for your life as well. I want my life to be a continual process of learning how to live for the Lord. How to labor for the Lord. And if that's going to be true, I have to remember that it all must begin with God. It all has to begin with God. This is what the Lord revealed to His disciples. This is what He taught His disciples. And we must see uh, that it has to become a reality in our own lives as well. Back in Mark chapter 3, let me give you some verses there you can read. Mark 3 verse 13, the Bible said, He, the Lord, goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto Him whom He would. And they came unto Him. And He ordained twelve that they should be with Him and that He might send them forth to preach and to have power. But I want you to see before these Men who were called became disciples. And before these disciples who were called were sent forth to preach. And before they had the power to preach and to be the disciples of the Lord, I want you to see that first of all, it had to begin with being with the Lord. He said He called them forth that they might be with Him. And before they could preach with power and be a disciple, it began with being with the Lord. It began with Him. And if I'm going to live for the Lord, labor for the Lord, make a difference for the Lord, it has to begin with Him. It has to begin with Him. This is what the Lord is helping us to see here. God's Word, we know, is all-sufficient. And it's the power of the Gospel that will save the souls of men, any man. And God has given the responsibility as God's people to share the Gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we can do it and be effective, we have to be with Him. 
We have to spend time with the Lord. And this is one of the great needs in our, in our lives today. Spending time being with the Lord. Letting everything in our lives begin with God. Everything, uh, the work of the Lord, living our lives beginning with God. In Matthew chapter 4, in verse number 18, we find this thought again. And he says, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway left they their nets and followed him. I want you to see that immediately they didn't begin to fish for men. Immediately they began to follow the Lord. They followed the Lord before they fished for men. And we'll never be fishers of men unless we're following the Lord. It has to begin with him first. It begins with being with the Lord first. This is, this is for all of God's people as well. This is not just for people in the ministry, but for all of us. Whatever we do, whatever our role in this world is, who we are is that we are God's people. And for the people of God, everything in our lives must begin with God. Everything has to go back and begin with Him. You may be a businessman, and we have a variety of different people in this church and you have all different types of things that you're involved in as far as working and holding down a job or some type of vocation and you may be a businessman in this world and you want to succeed and you want to make the right deal and maybe this is going to be a big week for you and the deal that you make is something you want to be right. I can tell you what, if it'll never be right unless you begin with God. That's where it has to begin. Even a business deal needs to begin with God. Let God lead and guide you. You may be a housewife and you want your home to be ordered up and to be run the right way and be everything it ought to be. I can tell you it never will be unless it begins with God. You have to begin with God, that great work of being that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, housewife and you may be a child today or a teenager and you say, you know, I really, really want to obey my parents and please them. I really want to, but I can tell you, you never will unless it begins with God. It's where it has to begin. It has to begin with God. Everything we are and do must begin with Him first. If it's ever going to be anything that means anything or pleases the Lord, you may be a young man or a woman. I mentioned we have so many in college and getting ready to graduate from college and, and uh, in chapters of their life and beginning new chapters of their life. You may be here today, you're thinking about uh, a, a companion, a spouse, a helpmate for life. You, know, you begin to think about those kind of things. You begin to think about, you know, some of the, these high school students, they panic if they're not, you know, in a relationship when they get out of high school. They think life's over, it's too short, it's done, over with, I'm never going to make it. And you know, it's not that way at all. But if you want that for your life and you want the right one, it has to begin with God. And maybe you're here today and you're single, an adult at a different stage in your life. You find yourself today where you never thought you'd be. I can tell you what, it's got to begin with God if any good thing will ever happen in the future. It has to begin with God. Everything must begin with God. God's people must seek from God and His Word how to do all we do and be all that we are and have the things that we ought to have. We should not seek it from the world. And we as God's people can't remember that though it's so tempting, we can't practice the worldly doctrine or method of pragmatism. You know, the pragmatists, they just look around and say, well, it looks like it works, so it must be okay. And if it's okay and it seems to be working for somebody else, that means it might be all right for me to do it. But for God's people, it must begin with us. And in our heart, we have to decide everything about us is going to begin with God. Not just what we see other people doing. Not just what we see working for other people. It must begin with God and the Lord's disciples here. You know, these men, these disciples, they would have had, they would have had no life to live if it didn't begin with the Lord. They would have had no life because they followed and watched the Lord's life. And that's the life they began to live. But it began with Him. And they would have had, they would have had nothing to preach without it beginning with the Lord. No ministry without it beginning with the Lord. And we can't live the Christian life without it beginning with Christ. Proverbs chapter 29, the 18th verse. 
The Bible says there in a familiar verse, if there's no vision, the people perish. This word vision, it's a, it's a word, it, it really means revelation. It means being able to see what God shows us. Having revealed to us by God and being able to see that. And having what we see affect what we do and who we are. And we must begin with God. We need to look to the Lord and see what it is that God's revealing to our hearts and lives as the people of God through His Word and by His Spirit. Be led of these things with all of our heart and all of our lives. It must begin with God. I want to encourage you today. I've given just thought here to three different categories, but... I'm encouraging you today to let everything in your life begin with the Lord. And the first one is our doing must begin with God. Our doing. And if nothing else, I'm going to give you some scripture you ought to commit to memory. Here's some good memory verses for you to remember. 1 Corinthians 10.31. That's a good one. Everybody ought to commit to memory. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. This is, the, this is this concept of letting it begin with God, everything in our life. Even though it seems mundane, routine, ordinary, temporal, of this earth, it still has to begin with God. Whatsoever it is. What are we doing with our lives? Because the Bible said whatsoever we do, we're to do for the glory of God. What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with our homes and families? What is it that we're allowing our families to do and be involved in? Why are we doing these things? Well, well, it really must begin with God. It needs to go back and begin with Him. Life is filled with things to do. I joke all the time with parents. A lot of times, I, the one thing that triggers me is when somebody says, I'm bored. I just don't, I have no concept of that. I, I cannot grasp that at all. I'm bored. I know kids do that a lot. I'm bored. Well, you know, maybe, maybe we can show them some things to do. <laughs> Help them get something going there. And I'd say if we have them some things to do, it would be amazing how they could learn and adapt to occupy their time when we didn't have something for them to do. They wouldn't get bored, but people get bored. I, I can't understand that. For me, there's more to do than time to do. And there's so many things we can do. We can make so many choices about things to do. But what, what is the right motivation to do what we do? Is it, is it simply because it's there to do? Is that the right motivation? I heard somebody uh, was telling a story one time about a man who climbed a mountain. He was going to climb up Mount Everest and he took off and he began to climb that Mount Everest and, and uh, he was never seen from again. Recently, within the last four or five years, this man who sought to climb the mountain 75 years earlier was found frozen dead and nearly preserved completely halfway up Mount Everest by another group of people climbing that mountain. When they began to understand why that man had climbed the mountain, the man simply had said before, because it's there and I've never done it before, I'm going to go and do it. But certainly in his case, it didn't turn out right. It didn't turn out good for him, even though it was there and it was something that he could do. You know, we're doing things in our lives because we can do them and because they're there to do that isn't necessarily the right thing to do. And it's not going to eventually profit anything, but they're there and we can do them. And it's all right to do it because it's there. At least that's what we think. Is that the right motivation? You know, certainly it ought not to be for God's people. It ought to not be for the Lord's people, me, as a father and a husband, as a pastor, maybe you as a parent, as a spouse, as an employer or an employee, why is it that we do the things that we do? You know, we ought to do what we do because God directs us to do it. We ought to do what we do because God has guided us to do it. I'm talking about even in the most mundane things of life, the simple things, the everyday things of life. We need to get back to where it all begins with God. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. 
For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. The word findeth, this word has to do with something that did not happen on purpose. There was a, there was a purposeful effort to seek out and to know. And God will lead and guide us in the things that we do with our lives. But we have to let it begin with Him. There's a lot of things, especially young people, can get involved in because it's there, because it can be done. But really, God doesn't lead or guide them to do that. In, in our lives, it must begin with God. All of our doing must begin with Him. And there'll be opportunities and there'll be situations and circumstances where the door is open, but it's not necessarily the will of God that we do those things or that we involve ourselves with those things. But God will lead and guide us. And it begins with God, our doing. Let me give you another one. Our duplicating must begin with God. What do you mean by that? Well, I'll give you another memory verse. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Be you followers, be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, this is Paul speaking. He was a follower of the Lord. But we, too, ought to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, ultimately, we are to be duplications of Him. We're to reproduce His life in this world through Christ living within us. We're to be Christians. And that means like Christ, a little Christ in this world. And, you know, in a church ministry, as a pastor, I'm often, I often have had well-meaning people see what is drawing crowds at another church or what seems to be working in some other place. And they'll suggest that, you know, we follow that example. Pastor, why can't we do this? Or why can't we have that? Or, you know, it, it seems to be doing fine over here. And boy, people are flocking into that and they're coming to this and that and the other. And I, you know, I've had well-meaning people do that. One of the very first things I had to deal with as a brand, brand new pastor, my first church, I'm pastoring, I want to do well and I want to make the right decision, is to have these people in the church who are peripheral people. They only ever showed up on Sunday morning. And they came to me and they said, Pastor, there's this contemporary musician and they want to have a concert and they're looking for a place to use our, they want to use our church and have this contemporary Christian rock concert. You think it'd be all right? <laughs> a very first thing I had to deal with as a pastor. You know, people are all the time coming and they're, they're, they're asking these kind of things. Sometimes, sometimes they're far out there like that, you know. But other times, they may, be, they may be seeing good churches do good things that aren't necessarily unscriptural. And they, you know, what about us? Why don't we duplicate what they're doing in order that we might try to have the same success that they're having? But you know, the reality of the matter is, is that what we do as a local church and how I lead our local church and what we're involved in as a local church, they have to be things that I believe God has directly led me to lead our church into being involved with. Because the truth of the matter is, is God wants to lead us and God wants to guide us. And God speaks to the hearts and lives of men. I have to always ask myself, did this begin with God? Did this begin with God? The Christian life is, is about more than simply imitating what we see others do. The Christian life is it's more, about, it's, it's more than that. It's realizing that we as God's people can hear from God. That God will lead me. God will lead you. God will lead your family. God will lead uh, you as a father to be the spiritual leader of your home. God will lead you as parents to be the type of parents God would have you to be for His children. God will lead you as a Sunday school teacher, as a, as, a, as, a, as a worker in the work of the Lord. God will lead us. God will guide us. And it's more than just simply imitating what we see others do. It's about doing what, uh, you know, it's about doing more than what's the status quo. Especially you as parents. You know, we kind of get sometimes our idea of parenting from watching what everybody else does. What does everybody else allow their children to do? You're, you will be approached many, many times, but dad, but mom, so-and-so does that. They have that. They go there. They watch that. They listen to that. So-and-so's mom and dad, let them do that. 
And you're going to be forced to make a choice. Do you do what you do with your children simply because everybody else does it? Or are you going to do what you do because God said that's what He wanted you to do as a parent? It has to begin with God, doesn't it? It has to begin with Him. And it's more than just the status quo. It's more than just because uh, everybody else does it or that's the way that it's always been done. No, we believe God speaks to us. He speaks to our hearts and lives. And uh, we believe as the people of God, we can hear from God that His Holy Spirit will lead us as individuals and families and that we can follow the Lord with our own hearts and lives. One of the, uh, my most uh, enjoyable passages of Scripture in the Old Testament is in Nehemiah. I enjoy the book of Nehemiah. I enjoy studying the life of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a man that God, God was leading and God was guiding in the great work of going back into Jerusalem after the occupation by the Babylonians after the release from Babylonian captivity, rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Ezra had gone back to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah came back to rebuild the walls and the gates and protect the city again from the enemies. Reestablish that environment and community of Israel in God's promised land. And Nehemiah came back. And he came back to see what task lied ahead of him. And he saw and he faced all the ruin and the rubble of the city walls of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, he says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do in Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung poured, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof, which were consumed with fire. And then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. And then I went up into the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor the rulers, nor the rest that did the work. You say, Pastor, why would you read that verse of Scripture? I hope you'll mark in chapter uh, number 2 here in the 12th verse what he said. He said here in this passage of Scripture, what my God had put in my heart. What my God had put in my heart. What is it you're trying to say? I'm trying to say, what does God have for you? What has God put in your heart? Because God speaks to the hearts and lives of His people. God speaks and directs families. And when we let things begin with God, God will lead and guide you. God has a plan for you. You young people who are here today, what is it God wants for your life? You have plans you have a future laid out for yourself? Did it begin with God? Is it what God wants for you? Is it what God leads and guides you to do? Because God will speak to you. Nehemiah had a God that spoke directly to his heart and said, Nehemiah, this is my plan. This is my will. And Nehemiah held that within his own heart. I think because, if anything, all the other people would have thought he was crazy. They would have said, you can't do it. They would have said there's no way that that can happen when they saw the debris and the ruin, which was so great they couldn't even ride a, a horse through the uh, city of the, uh, Jerusalem around the walls. The rubble was so great. And they would have said, you're crazy. You're a dreamer. It'll never happen. I tell you, I don't know how many pastors, if people knew what God laid in their heart for their church, they'd get the guy out of there the next day if they could. Scare them to death because God had spoken to their heart about what the future was and what God wanted to do and how He wanted to lead and guide that church, that ministry, those people. And God speaks to our hearts. There are many principles of Scripture in God's Word. Principles that are there for everyone. And if we disobey them and if we give no heed to them, we're going to wind up on the negative end of them. Principles of Scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and He'll add all these things unto you. A principle of Scripture, every one of us, is to prioritize the work of the Lord and to give for the work of the God, support it, and put it first, and God will provide the things of our life. That's a principle for all. But beyond that point, God leads and guides us as individuals. 
God has a plan for you. He doesn't want you simply to be a copy of someone else. He wants you to be the person God saved you to be. It has to begin with Him. Our doing, what do we do? Why are we doing what we do? It has to begin with God. And who we are and what we are has to begin with God. Let me give you this third one. Our demands must begin with God. What is the great need that you perceive of your life? Or what is it that you feel like your life is demanding above all other things? You know, we have to be sure that realizing what these things are and prioritizing the needs and the demands of our life, we have to be sure it begins with God. That it begins with Him. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, I quoted a verse there a moment ago, but if you go back and you read through that entire chapter, when you come to Matthew 6, He begins to speak to the true need of men and His people. And in the first seven verses, He's showing us here that there are many people who determine their needs and what they do based and the kind of people they are based upon what they see others do. And they just set about duplicating what they see other people to do. And many people live to try to obtain and, uh, what, they, what they see others trying to obtain. They live to get and gain what they see other people get and gain. And if that's important to other people, it must be important to them. But I want you to know today, our demands and our needs, we must determine those and it must begin with God. It must begin with God. When you come down to the 8th verse in Matthew chapter 6, he gives us another illustration and principle. He says, Be not ye therefore like unto them. Be not like them. For your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. You know, today we understand and know that, that uh, uh, we may really not even know what we need. But we have a God who knows all things who does know what we need. And if we'll begin seeking for our needs as God directs and leads and guides us, then we can prioritize them in the right place. And I'll not spend all my life doing the things that God hasn't led and directed me to do or trying to be what God has never led or directed me to be. And I can cut through all of that. And I can get down to what God has for me. And I can see the needs that God has for me. We live in a world today in this umbrella of religion. It's what we've been looking at in the last couple of parables in my Sunday school class. The world throws religion all under the same umbrella, in the same tree. And we know that the illustrations of the parables that there are dirty birds that have lodged in the tree of Christianity or religion, as the world would have us to believe it uh, to be, and that, uh, that uh, many of them are in no way of God or of the Lord or led of God even though the world sees them that way. But when we think about this umbrella of religion, by and large, it uses the business model of finding out what the needs of the people are, and they build their ministry around those needs. We live in that world today, in the contemporary Christian movement. You know, why do, you, why do we feel like that has gained ground and is so popular? Because some people felt like that's what they needed. Is it what they needed? Is it what God's Word directs that people need in this world? Well, there's a lot of discussion we could discuss and a lot of study that we could study, but that's where it has to begin. Is this of God? Is it directed of God? And yet there are people who wanted that, and so it was developed and given to them. We know that the same thing is true about this casual movement, you know, come as you are and wear what you want to wear and all that kind of thing. I never could really understand that. You know, people not wanting to look their very best when they come to church on Sunday morning. If i got a suit and a tie, I'm going to wear it. I believe i come to honor the Lord here and meet with God. You say, well, you're legalistic or whatever, and I'm not comfortable wearing those kind of clothes, and I don't prove anything to anybody but me wearing my best clothes. But you see all those lines of thought, you know what they all go back to? They all go back to me. And this whole thing's not about me. It's about Him. It's not about me. It's about Him. And so those, those don't hold any weight with me, all those arguments and things, because they're arguments that come back to the flesh and what we like. I feel better in my shorts and my flip-flops on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, all right. What we, whatsoever we do, we ought to do for the glory of God, shouldn't we? 
And, uh, you know, this whole movement, non-confrontationalistic type preaching where we don't talk about the blood of Christ or about how people are sinners or how people need to repent and get saved. You know, that whole concept. Why is that popular? Because people want that. They want that. And so a product is developed to meet that niche in the religious marketplace. Uh, this idea of, you know, this whole seeker-friendly movement. Young people in colleges today, Bible colleges, they're trained to go into communities and start a new church by finding out what the, church, what the people in the community like as far as religion goes and what they don't like. Give them what they want, but don't give, give them what they don't like and you'll be successful. And that's what they tell them to do. And that's how they build their church ministries. And if you'll notice, many of the new and growing churches or organizations in our community, they're that kind where they're finding out what people want. And they're giving the people what they want, but they're not giving them what they don't want. Well, I can tell you what, sometimes the things we don't want are the things we need. The things we don't want are the things we really need. And God knows, doesn't He? God knows best. God knows what we need. And we've got to be sure that, that uh, what we really need begins with God. And it's not our flesh or the world or the devil telling us what we need. But our needs begin with God. Uh, God created us and He knows and knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And we need to seek and know and be shown from God what we need and then live to see those needs met. What we do and what we duplicate and our demands or our needs, these all must begin with God. Let me give you this last one. Our desires must begin with God. Our desires. Psalm 37 verse 4, another verse you can commit to memory. Put on your memory verse list. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Say, so how is that possible? How is that possible? When it all begins with God, we'll delight in what God delights in. And so God will have no problem giving us what we delight in. Because it's what He delights in. But if it's not beginning with God, and it's beginning somewhere else, and what I want, and what I desire for my life is of my flesh, or been substituted by the devil, or is an imitation of the world, then I may find myself in a position where I'm struggling to get what I think I want, and I just can't ever seem to have it. And maybe God's gracious because God knows what we really need, and He's not giving it to us. Some of the worst times in my life when I got what I thought I needed and then I got stuck finding out I didn't, don't really want what I think I wanted. God's talking about our wants, our desires, what it is that delights us in living. And God, God wants us to know that those things must also begin with God. I think about you know, what I want, what I desire for my family, for loved ones, for our church. I can, you know, I could write you a page of things I want, things that I would be pleased with seeing happen. Good things, nothing wrong, good things. But, you know, our dreams and desires, even though they can be good things, we have to find out, are they God-directed things? Are they God-guided things, or are they things we just could do or have or be? Because God directs and God guides and God leads our doings and our desires and our delights. Isaiah chapter 55, there we find as God speaks, He says about Himself in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reality is we don't really know what's best for us. We don't really know without God. What's best for us, what's best for our family, our loved ones, our church. We don't really know that, but God does know. God knows. And when we make a decision to give our time or our talent or our treasure to the pursuit of a thing, anything, we have to be sure that it's begun with God. It began with Him. That He's involved in it. And today, today, I just wanted to ask you, for you personally, what is it that, that has begun in the heart of God that God is directing you to do with your life? You ever considered it? 
ever given it thought? What is it that God has begun? What is it God has put in your heart and life that God's directing you to do? Are you hearing Him? That's where it has to begin. It has to begin with hearing Him. Are you seeing what He's revealing to you? With no vision, the people perish. Without the vision of God, the leadership direction of God, our lives can be wasted. Not only do lost souls perish, but we can perish living for that which is not important. Brother Doug made a quote yesterday that I've heard the man make the quote, and it's a great quote. He said, sometimes one of the greatest dangers in the world is being successful at things that a million years from now aren't really going to make any difference, aren't going to matter. But people are so successful at them, they give themselves entirely to them. and They miss out entirely on what God wants for their life what God has for them because they're good at these things of the world and they're missing out on the things of God. God wants to direct you. What is it God's saying to you? What has God placed in your heart for your life? Are you hearing Him? Are you seeing what it is that He's revealing to you? Uh, our lives, our families, our church, we have to be sure it begins with Him. And so today, just a simple message just to remind us that in the beginning, God... In the beginning, God. And that's what we need to say about everything in our lives. In the beginning, it all began with God. God led me. God guided me. God showed me this is what He would have for my heart and for my life. This is what God wants me to delight in living for. It all has to begin with Him. Let's bow our heads. We have a word of prayer together. In a moment, we'll stand and we'll sing a verse of an invitation song. But maybe this morning you came to church, but you've never received Christ as your personal Savior. Everything has to begin with the day that you meet the Lord as your personal Savior. And if you've never met Christ as your personal Savior, today's where that, that, day, that day needs to be today. I want to encourage you with heads bowed and eyes closed. Slip out of your seat and come. Let us take a Bible and show you from the Word of God how Christ died for you, how He lives for you, how He'll give you personally forgiveness of your sin debt and He'll give you personally eternal life and how He'll come to live in your heart and life. and He'll lead and guide you. If you're here and you do not know Christ as your Savior, we want to encourage you to come. Be saved today. Let the Lord do for you what He wants to do for you. And if you're here today and you know the Lord is your Savior, it all has to begin with Him. We can get so busy doing because we can and because it's there that we miss doing the things God directs us to do, God wants us to do. Be sure all that you're doing is for the glory of God, that God can use it for His honor and for His glory. It has to begin with God. If you're here today and you know the Lord is your Savior, you're duplicating what it is that you're that you're becoming or wanting to be, be sure it's led of God, not just that it's what others do. Let God lead you. Let God guide you individually. Let Him show you what it is He wants for your life as a businessman or a housewife or a, a college student or a high school student, as a mom, as a dad, as a child, as a parent, as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone who either employs or is an employee. Let God lead and guide you as to what He would have you to be. How He wants you to be what you are. Let God, let it begin with God. Let God lead and guide you in the demands or the needs of your life. The things you feel like are the most needful. And be sure that those are the things God has shown you are. And prioritize your life according to what God has shown you are the great needs of your life, your family. Let it begin with God. Let, let what we delight in begin with God. Live. Live your life being pleased and delighted in the same things that please God and delight the Lord. Let it begin with Him. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'd have your way in the invitation for those that are unsaved, that are lost, sinners, separated from you. I pray today they'll come, led of the Holy Spirit, they'll be saved. And Lord, for us that know you as, your, as, as our Savior, we pray today, Lord, you'd, let it, you'd, you'd guide and lead us in all these other areas of our life. Let everything about our life begin with you. Everything. Lord, 
Help us not to compartmentalize or shut the door for parts of our lives from you and your leadership and guidance. Help us, God, not to, not to just be involved in what's available to be involved in, but be led of God to be involved in it. To be doing, Lord, what your word would direct and lead and guide us to do. Help us, Lord, to be followers of you. Help us, Lord, to uh, de desire, Father, uh, what it is that you desire. Delight in what you delight in. Help us, Lord, today, God, to have the needs, Lord, as priorities of our life that, Lord, you say our needs. Help us, lead and guide us, speak to us. Help us as individuals to hear you and respond to you. May you have your way today. Lord, may you give people today courage to be obedient. I ask God in Jesus' name you'd be glorified now. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll stand together and turn to Him. 293 in our hymn book, M293. We'll sing that first verse together. The Lord's spoken to you. We invite you to respond to Him, either to come and be saved, to come and find out what it means to follow the Lord and believers' baptism after you've been saved, to know what it means to unite with this local church, to give your heart and life to the leadership of God and seek His leadership and guidance in your life. Whatever it is, we want to be obedient as we sing on the first verse, M293. <clears throat> Finish up with a word of prayer. Any choir practices or anything? 515. All right. For everybody that are going to sing in the choir, would like to. You say, I haven't done it. I've just never gone up, but I'd like to. Then come on and uh, be here tonight at 515. And uh, you don't have to audition out loud or anything like that. You don't have to do that. Uh, just come on and be here and uh, just uh, sing like I sing. I, I can't read music, but I do sing by letter. I sing by let her fly. Just open up, let her fly. So that'd be a good way for you to do too. And uh, some people, just, yeah, you know, I know you don't think anything about it, but some people go up in the choir and they'll say, "Oh, do you sing alto or do you sing tenor or do you sing this or that?" I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna sing page whatever they tell me to sing. So some of you that are smart like that, you don't think some of us don't know what you're talking about, uh, but. Uh, Anyway, it's good to be here today. Appreciate folks coming out. Six o'clock tonight, and then again, if you want to be here for choir practice, 515, come out and, and be here as well. And uh, don't forget about the things. We just ask you to make matters of prayer and uh, all of our prayer lists, Sunday school prayer lists and Wednesday night church prayer lists, all these kind of things. Uh, just remember these things in prayer. But we'll pray and be dismissed today. Again, good to see everyone. Appreciate folks coming out and being here in our services here this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for how good you are to us. Thank you for your, uh, for your word. And Lord, we just pray that you would remind us as God's people that, Lord, before we even put our feet on the floor, every morning we wake up, help us just to begin that day with you and put that day in your hands and put it in perspective, Lord, that that day, God, we want everything, everything that we do to be for your honor and glory. And Lord, help us, God, in our doing, in our duplicating, in our delighting, in our demandings, and 
Lord, all these things help them each to begin with you. And Lord, we pray that you would just have control of our lives and lead and guide us. And Lord, we just ask, Father, that we might, uh, Lord, be found in your will. And that, Lord, we know and can find the will of God. What a blessing. And so, Lord, we just commit these things into your hands. We just pray you'd, uh, Lord, give us a good afternoon. And this evening we'd be back ready, Lord, to hear from the word of God, to worship you by being obedient. And, Lord, to sing and these things that cause our hearts to, to rightly consider you. Uh, we just ask, Father, you'd help us, God, today. Be in prayer about it. Invite someone to come back and be our guest Thank you for that privileged opportunity we have. We ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen.